Stung by the Brexit vote, U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry headed to Brussels in London for emergency talks. Boosting the fortunes of the coffee industry in Burundi. And an Australian school helps students ease exam stress with the help of an unusual group of therapists. Africa 54 starts right now. Good evening, I'm Esther Gidoy Ewart. This is Africa 54. Vincent Macori is off today. Jittery global markets continued to react Monday with volatility following Thursday's decision by British voters to exit the European Union. Meanwhile, U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry is in Europe for emergency meetings in Brussels and London over Britain's referendum vote to exit the EU. The most important thing is that all of us as leaders work together to provide as much continuity, as much stability, as much certainty as possible in order for the marketplace to understand that uh, there are ways to minimize disruption, there are ways to smartly move ahead in order to protect the values and interests that we share in common. In London, Kerry will find a political situation in flux. Conservative Prime Minister David Cameron announced his resignation Friday and there are growing calls in the opposition Labour Party for leader Jeremy Corbyn to resign, blaming him of failing to galvanise support within Labour to defeat Brexit. The critical point is a general election is coming. In my opinion, the new leader of the Conservative Party will have to call a general election to get a fresh mandate this autumn. The big question Jeremy has to answer is, does he honestly believe that he's the right leader of our party to take us into that general election, particularly in the context of a monumentally complex task of negotiating these Brexit uh, negotiations? Scotland's first minister, Nicola Sturgeon, one of the most proactive politicians north or south of the border with England, denounced Britain's political leaders as incompetent during an interview Sunday on BBC television. It's utter chaos, shambolic and frankly disgraceful. You know, a time when the whole United Kingdom needs leadership, probably more than it's needed leadership in any part of the post-war uh, period. You've got the Conservative Party and the Labour Party completely abdicating responsibility. Uh, they're letting down people across England, across the entire UK, and I look on in utter horror. It is shameful and somebody needs to get their act together. Sturgeon also insisted that the Scottish Parliament had the power to veto Brexit by withholding its consent. Scotland voted overwhelmingly in Thursday's referendum to stay in the European Union. Sturgeon has already warned she will explore every option to keep Scotland in the bloc, including seeking a possible second independence referendum. A petition for rerunning the referendum has gained more than three million signatures, almost guaranteeing a parliamentary debate that will likely compound the fractures within both the Labour and Conservative parties over Brexit. Britain's decision to leave the EU is resounding in America's presidential race. VOA's Michael Bowman reports Republican presumptive nominee Donald Trump sees Britain's move as an affirmation of his campaign's core messages, while Democrat Hillary Clinton sees the episode as further evidence that Trump is unfit to be president. Brexit's surprise victory left the Obama administration scrambling to put the best face on an outcome it did not want. One country has made a decision. Obviously, it was a decision that the United States uh, had hoped would go the other way, but it didn't. And so we begin with a fundamental respect for voters. But Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump appeared to welcome the outcome. Uh, people want to take their country back. Uh, they want to have independence in a sense. I really do see a parallel between what's happening in the United States and what ha what's happening here. People want to see borders. In a volatile world, the last thing we need is a volatile president. Democratic presumptive nominee Hillary Clinton's campaign pounced on Trump's assertion that British monetary turmoil might benefit his business venture in Scotland. Every president is tested by world events, but Donald Trump thinks about how his golf resort can profit from them. 
But if the Brexit vote illuminated public discontent on one side of the Atlantic, Republicans say similar sentiments exist on the other side as well. I think what you saw in England, at least from what I read, is that people got tired of being dictated to by unelected bureaucrats in Brussels. And of course, we have a lot of that here in this country, a lot of the president's uh, bureaucrats uh, in expanding uh, regulations in a way that slow our economy and make it difficult for us to have growth. A new poll shows Clinton leading Trump, but that most voters want a new direction for America. Democrats insist the electorate is not blinded by unease and discontent. The differences between Secretary Clinton and Donald Trump in terms of temperament, in terms of judgment, in terms of values, couldn't be more stark. And they're on, they're on display once again over the last two weeks. A transatlantic shockwave rattling a lackluster U.S. economic recovery could be a wild card in the election. The Obama administration is stressing the need to minimize disruptions stemming from Brexit. Michael Bowman, VOA News, Washington. Liberian President Alan Johnson Sirleaf, who is also chairman of the Economic Community of West African States, spoke out from the capital Monrovia Monday on a variety of topics, including Ebola and trade and investment. But most importantly, she says the rise of terrorism in West Africa remains a major security threat in the region. There is a serious challenge, as you know. Uh, several of our countries just face attacks. Burkina Faso, Cote d'Ivoire, uh, others that have faced threats. So it is a continuing problem. And as long as we have these terrorist groups, as long as we have, even within our own region, groups as the groups that are operating in the north of Mali that continue to be a problem, as long as we have that, it will always be a threat. President Salif also called for more support from the United Nations and key bilateral partners to help fight terrorism. U.S. First Lady Michelle Obama is in Liberia Monday as part of a three-day nation, six-day six trip abroad. Mrs. Obama, along with her daughters Sasha and Malia, and her mother are visiting the West African nation as part of an effort to promote girls' education. And joining us now by phone from Monrovia is James Buddy host and managing editor of VOA's Daybreak Africa radio program. Good evening, James. Good evening, and good evening to your listeners. All right, James, tell us more about Mrs. Obama's visit to Liberia. Uh, Mrs. Obama arrived to Liberia this um, afternoon about, say, 1 p.m. local time. Um, uh, as you know, she's here as part of the Let Girls Learn uh, project that she and President Obama started in 2015. So she came, uh, we are, in fact, we are on our way from Kakata, uh, about uh, 35 to 45 miles from uh, Monrovia, uh, where she came. This is where the Peace Corps training facility is. Um, she had a chance to, first of all, thank the Peace Corps for what they are doing, for coming back to Liberia after some time. Um, she also chatted with uh, young Liberian women. As you know, um, in my discussion with the Minister of Education, he outlined some of the difficulties that uh, uh, Liberian, young Liberian girls were having in accessing quality education and staying in school. So this is what Mrs. Obama is here for. She talked with the uh, young women and said that uh, she's been reading about them, uh, some of the things that they are doing. Uh, she said she had come here with her two daughters uh, and her mother just to show girl power to give them support. Right now, we are on our way from Kakata to uh, somewhere called the Unification Town, where Mrs. Obama is going to also be meeting with some students there at uh, R.S. Caulfield uh, High School. So this is where we are going now. She, she's going to have an opportunity to also talk, talk with the young women at that particular school. James, are you there? I'm here. Over to you. 
All right, James, uh, what are the challenges, briefly, maybe in uh, 20 seconds, that the girls face in Liberia in terms of education? Uh, pardon me. James, uh, could, you, could you repeat your question? The, some of the challenges that the young girls are facing in terms of education in Liberia that uh, the First Lady will be uh, facing uh, when she meets with the girls in schools in your country. I'm a very noisy, noisy press bus. So if I don't understand your question, please uh, bear okay. with me. Okay, James, Again, we're going to move on. We'll, we'll touch base yes. with you as uh, the First Lady of the United States gets uh, to the schools in Liberia. James, thank you. James Buddy is the host and managing editor of VOS Daybreak Africa radio program. Mrs. Obama will also visit Morocco and Spain. Michelle Obama will be joined by actresses Meryl Streep and Frida Pinto in Morocco, where they will talk to adolescent girls on challenges they face in getting an education. Now, six years after South Sudan gained independence from Sudan, there is little to celebrate. There has been sporadic fighting in various parts of the country, including the Equatorial and the Bahel Ghazal regions. This past weekend, 10,000 people are reported to have been displaced when fighting broke out in Wau. South Sudan President Salva Kiir and first Vice President Riek Machar recently formed a new transition government of national unity, but peace remains elusive and education and the health care system have nearly collapsed and thousands of citizens have fled and sought refuge in neighboring countries while others remain internally displaced. Women and children bear the brunt of the civil war. And joining me here in the studio to tell us more on the situation in South Sudan is Hannah Andrew Dijok, founder of Sisters of Hope South Sudan. Hannah, welcome to Africa 54. Thank you for, for hosting me. Next week on July 9th, there will be celebration six years after South Sudan gained independence from Sudan. But is there anything to celebrate given the fighting going on in the country? I don't think. Our, my people are not ready to celebrate anything because the fighting is continuing until this week. So um, nobody is happy to celebrate anything. People are crying, people keep dying everywhere, and the economic problem is still there. So uh, the country is collapsed economically. So we are not ready to celebrate anything. And the World Food Program has also sounded a warning. There is drought in the country, but there is uh, severe food shortages. And uh, you, as the founder of Sisters of Hope, is working to help women and children who bear the brunt of the civil war. What are you doing exactly on the ground in the South Sudan? Yeah. Um, Sisters of Hope for South Sudan have three objectives, education and health care and health, health care and women empowerment. Our mission is to create the, to build the school for kids and to empower women. Because uh, uh, the society is, is, uh, is collapsed, South Sudan, so, yeah. So we, we, are, we, are, we are going to build our society, we are, we are going to, to build to have the healthy society by empowering women, to create jobs, and then to reduce the poverty, and corruption and domestic violence. Um, our pe my people are still suffering, even in Khartoum, Sudan, and Ethiopia. People are still dying because of malnutrition. And I hope my, our leader will do their best to bring peace in, in, in my country because, uh, because it's their duty to do the maximum to, to stop the suffering on South, South Sudanese people. And Hannah, any, has anything come up of the new uh, government of national unity that was formed recently when Riek Machar returned to the country as the first vice president? When Dr. Riek Machar came back to Juba, everybody was happy and um, uh, we are hoping to see change with the new government. But at the same time, there is a mixed feeling. Some people are happy because uh, we, try, we are trying. To, to, to face this situation. And other people are not seeing any progress. So, and the reason why, it's because there is a lot of obstacle in this new government. And some of obstacle is 20 state. 
which is the totally violation of peace agreement because when President Kiir created these the strategic states, it was outside of constitution of South Sudan. So it's difficult to implement peace with 20 states. That's why the fighting keep going because the people are fighting for their land. And very briefly, Hannah, do most South Sudanese feel that it was a big mistake to uh, try to separate from Sudan in the first place? Because all we've seen is chaos after chaos since uh, South Sudan gained independence. Um, what happened in South Sudan, it is, it is really something even a lot of South Sudanese don't understand what is going on because uh, we are suffering with Sudan and everybody, all we need is to have our own country and for independent everybody will vote for separation. But three years later, the fighting was started in South Sudan. So even now there is a lot of people we, we're still hoping to have peace in this country and to continue to, to enjoy our riches and our country. But our leaders are not doing their best. So you want and your I leaders ask, to do more than exactly, they're doing right exactly. now? Even, even international community okay. right. have to press them to stop everything because... Uh, we, yeah. hope, we hope for the best. Hannah Andrew Dijok is founder Sisters of Hope for South Sudan. Thank you very much, Hannah, for your Thank insight you. into you. South Sudan. We want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover. Join the conversation on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. And check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Coming up, we'll tell you what the top foreign exchange earner is in Burundi. Stay with us. My name's Carla Babb and I work the Pentagon Beat. That access helps me to do better stories. Every day it's my responsibility to collect all of the defense news. It keeps our VOA viewers informed. I get to travel all across the globe. Anything that's defense related and how to protect and keep people safe, that's where I'll go. So it's never a dull moment at the Pentagon. My name is Carla Babb, this is my Beat. Welcome back. Professor Akbar Ahmed is Chair of Islamic Studies in American University in Washington and the former Pakistani High Commissioner to the UK and Ireland. In his work, he often examines the relationship of the West to Islam. He talked to VOA's Mohammed al Shinawi about his latest documentary, Journey into Europe. The documentary Journey into Europe is part of a bigger project. It is an independent film based on my travels in Europe with my uh, wonderful team of young American scholars. But it accompanies a book also called Journey into Europe, being published by Brookings Press here in Washington. This project is part of a quartet of studies in which I examine relations between the West and the world of Islam. And these four projects have taken me over a decade in which I've examined in a very complex, sophisticated way from different angles the same subject, which is relations between America and the Muslim world. And you're seeing with the events taking place as we speak, events in Orlando where this terrible tragedy took place, where some 50 people died, 50 completely innocent Americans and 50 were injured. You're seeing how again and again and again we have discussions around the nature of Islam, the subject of Islam, the history of Islam, the culture of Islam, and all that is now being tied into presidential politics in the United States. So Akbar Ahmed also talked about the long-term effects terrorist attacks have in the way people in the West perceive Muslims. These attacks in Paris, in Brussels, and the previous attacks in London, in Madrid, and of course 9-11 in the United States, these terrible attacks have a cumulative effect. So if there was one attack, it would be bad enough. But as a scholar studying and writing uh, this project, Journey into Europe, 
I look back and I say, what is going on? Because you have not one attack, two attacks. It's a series of attacks. And it's happening with great frequency. And it should cause a great deal of concern, both to local administration and to the Muslim leadership. He concluded his interview by making a call to people of all religions. We need to revive the memory of a time when Muslims, Christians and Jews could live together, work together and create uh, together. So that's, that's one of the great lessons I hope that people will take from the book and the film. That was Professor Akbar Ahmed, Chair of Islamic Studies at American University here in Washington, D.C. In Burundi, coffee remains the main foreign exchange earner for the country. The government says they are they're more focused on quality than quantity. Moses Javier Imana reports. More than 80% of Burundian population are farmers. At least 600,000 families depends on coffee farming. The country's economy is predominantly agriculture, which accounts to over 30% of GDP and employs more than 90% of the population. Subsistence farming accounts for 90% of agriculture. Coffee remains the major cash crop for the country, earning more than 70% of the foreign exchange. Access to bank loans is one of the major challenges Burundi coffee growers face. <laughs> For sure, I'm not even the one who planted them. This coffee plantation was planted by my parents. We are calling for the coffee price to be raised to at least 4 cents per kilogram manure. It's one of the challenging things we are facing to keep the land fertile. Burundi's primary export are coffee and tea, which account for 90% of foreign exchange earnings. Burundian coffee is mainly exported to Europe, Asia and United States of America. As Burundi's private sector and businesses were affected by the political crisis that erupted last year, coffee exporters say that the political crisis affected a little in the production and exportation of the product. We are working with uh, three cooperatives which has many farmers and we are also working with the individuals individual farmers who are bringing straight to the station. We are only focusing on quality. This is the difference between other washing station and our washing station. Burundi has 170 coffee washing stations and 8 dry mills with average harvest of 19,000 tons of coffee. 75% of the coffee farmers access the market directly without going through agents. 3 million people of the estimated 10 million Burundi population benefit directly from coffee. Last year, we produced more than 18,000 tons of coffee, and that's why we are expecting the same volume this year, because the production seems the same. Coffee contributes a lot to the homes of Burundians, most especially in the regions where coffee is grown. It helps in many family projects. We don't segregate. Coffee brings all Burundians together without regarding the ethnicity. We were born finding our parents drinking coffee. They said it's like leisure for the elderly. Burundi exports 17,000 tons to the outside world of coffee, but only 1% is consumed locally, most especially in these kind of places called Buyenzi in the local communities. Moses Javierimana for Voice of America, Bujumbura. It's time now for a short break still to come on Africa 54. Schools turn to faraway therapists to help students combat exam stress. We'll be right back. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, they tell you what people are talking about. So for an in-depth look at the stories trending high on social media, turn to hashtag VOA. It's not your typical talk show. From politics to pop culture, hashtag VOA brings in the people leading the conversation. 
engages the audience, and gets answers to your questions. Hashtag VOA, smart talk for smart people. Welcome back to Africa 54. Here's what's trending. The first so-called e-highway in the world is being tested in Sweden in a bid to lower greenhouse gas emissions from the transport sector. The project was initiated by Sweden's Transport Authority and is the result of technological cooperation between engineering company Siemens and truck manufacturer Scania. The idea is relatively simple. Trucks connect to overhead cables in a similar way to trams or trains. The engines then switch from diesel to electric. Purpose-built hybrid trucks seamlessly connect to the grid through a pantograph on the roof, then run on an electric motor. Sweden is aiming to achieve a fossil-free transport sector by 2030. Next up, wedding season is in full swing. This year, more and more couples are choosing to, the, to tie the knot in Santorini. The Greek island made famous by the film Mamma Mia has become one of the most sought-after places to get married in the world. It is a welcome boost for Greece that is still suffering the effects of the economic crisis. There are an estimated 1,000 to 1,500 weddings held on the island each season, all of them foreign couples. In the past few years, more than one million visitors have traveled to Santorini per year. This has allowed the island to weather the economic crisis hitting Greece. And finally. and finally, for many students, the pressure of end-of-semester exams can be overwhelming. One school in Australia's capital city of Canberra is adopting a unique strategy to ease exam stress, bringing kittens into the classroom. The fiery felines are filling classrooms and are a hit with students at this school. The kittens are easing exam anxiety, and now students can cuddle while they cram. Some schools are now willing to be a bit more creative when it comes to finding ways to keep stress at bay. The cats benefit from the attention too, getting some extra socialization before they move out of foster care into permanent homes. All the kittens that visit the school are up for adoption. And that is what is trending today. In sports news, Argentine football fans don't want to believe it. After a devastating loss, a dejected Lionel Messi says he's retiring from international football. The 29-year-old Barcelona forward missed a late-game penalty kick as Argentina lost a shootout to Chile in the Copa American final in New Jersey Sunday. Chile went on to win 4-2. It was Messi's fourth finals loss with the national team, the 2014 World Cup against Germany and three Copa Americas. After the match, the star forward said, it wasn't meant to be. I wanted this more than anything. I think this is it. Welcome to the Voice of America's News Words. Here is a story that has to do with defects or problems with cars. Listen for the word that means to take back something. Recall. They had meetings over this defect. They shared complaints over this defect. Yet there was no investigation by the government and no recall by General Motors until 10 years later. Recall. It is a word that means to ask people officially to return something. In our story, there were major problems with some General Motors cars. The man says the U.S. government and the car company took too long to issue a recall so the cars could be fixed. Now, when you hear the word recall, your American English will be good enough to know what this news word means. 